Thanks, John. It's uh, a pleasure to be here and I have a chance to talk with you about uh, some ideas. I never look forward to following Eric on a podium. <laughs> it is uh, always daunting to uh, uh, hear the magnificent progress and vision that uh, he had, others have led in genomics. What I'm going to talk about today is a little bit more of a historical perspective of where life science has been and where it is going. I'm going to not touch a lot on genomics, but clearly place genomics in part of that. And I'm going to talk about convergence as part of what I think this is going to lead to in the future. And from listening and looking at this program, clearly this issue has uh, caught a hold in Canada, and you're well ahead of the, the curve, I think, in this area of convergence of life science with engineering and physical and computational sciences. But let's start a little bit uh, back in the uh, history. One of the reasons I wanted to comment on this is this is the 100th anniversary of Salvador Luria's birth. Now, Salvador Luria was uh, a historical figure in science, in molecular biology in particular. He was the mentor of Jim Watson uh, after having immigrated from Italy to the U.S. He also started the Center for Cancer Research at MIT, where he uh, gave me my first academic job, and therefore I'm indebted to him for that. And in the Center for Cancer Research at MIT, uh, five individuals uh, associated with that center received the Nobel Prize, which is quite a, a, a development in a new institution. But this was in the mid-70s, and MIT made uh, the decision in the mid-70s to launch itself into a broader perspective of uh, molecular biology and cell biology under Salvador Luria. And that excited the campus uh, enormously, and it's led to a, a number of developments which I'll outline in a few moments. But the simple fact that a hundred years spans the whole life of one individual, and in the middle of that, there was the launch of molecular biology, says molecular biology is a very new science. And it's denoted from the fact of, or from the moment that Watson and Crick discovered the structure of DNA. And the reason that, was, and the nature of a gene that came with that, the chemical nature of a gene that came with that discovery. And the reason that that was so powerful is that it linked the biochemistry where one studied molecules at a time and determined their function, which had been going on for many, many decades in a century, and genetics where one studied the organism. But the link between those two was the nature of the gene, the nature of the information that was transmitted between generations. And it had an enormous catalytic effect in terms of science. And in fact, it is that event that I would argue is very similar to what in physics was Newton's principles of physics, which happened 200 years earlier. Now, the reason it's interesting to think about this time is that the implications, the impact of what this discovery in life science has, is going to mean is still mostly before us. It's things that uh, will happen in the future as we translate this new knowledge of the past 60 years into new uh, opportunities in science. And I will make the case that molecular life science is critical for meeting many global challenges, and that convergence of life science, as I mentioned with other disciplines, is absolutely critical for this activity. But let's look back over those last 60 years. As I mentioned in the beginning, you looked at the left side of this panel, you see Watson and Crick discovering the structure of DNA in 1953. And it took us the next 15 to 20 years to understand the central dogma, the nature of the transfer of information from the gene out into the cell, the translational and transcriptional activities. And then in the mid-70s, due to this basic science, just trying to understand what a gene is, we discovered the technology to do genetic engineering and genetic manipulation. And for the first time in the 70s and late 60s, we achieved as mankind the ability to synthesize genes 
and to modify the nature of organisms by design. And that has led to the establishment of the biotech industry and a number of other associated technologies which grew over this ability to do synthetic biology one gene at a time by pre-design in an in the old-fashioned way, but really having an enormous impact. And then, as you've heard from uh, Eric Lander's comments, in the mid, uh, late 80s, early 90s, there was the movement forward to sequence the whole ge human genome to provide genetic information that has, as you've heard over the last decade and will in decades in front of us, absolutely change the way we think of biological systems and the way we impact on society by translating that knowledge into advancements in society. But we're emerging from those days of genomics and looking forward to what's going to happen over the next decades in a broader perspective than just extending genomics. Where is this information going to go and how is it going to be translated into, into society? And there I think convergence is a major part of that activity. That convergence is organically grown at MIT and when we look at what's happening across the campus. The campus has become engaged over the last 20 years in the area of engineering, physical science, and computational science in life science. And that's reflected by the fact that there's a new department of biological engineering. A third of all MIT engineering faculty now have some part of their program in life science, spanning all the way from information technology to designing synthetic biological systems. And MIT is part of the greater cluster that has grown up in the uh, Boston area related to biotechnology, genomics, and uh, biomedical activities. And this has created a dynamic that is in impacting enormously on society and on the world. Let me just illustrate that dynamics by this picture. What is shown here in the yellow next to the blue, the blue is the Charles River in Cambridge, yellow is the MIT campus and all the buildings associated with it in southern Cambridge, and what is black there are all biotech, high-tech, industry, private sector, large organizations uh, on the edge of MIT. This is innovation in progress. Innovation meaning taking ideas, translating them into society, impacting by producing something people are using and benefit from. And what you see is uh, associated across the boundaries of MIT, not only a hundred or more small companies that are not pictured here, but companies that uh, range from Pfizer's uh, International Research Headquarters, Novartis International Research Headquarters, Sophia Ventus uh, Research Headquarters, to Biogen and, and Genzyme and, and a number of other companies that have taken the technology and innovation and moved it from the campus into society. And the other thing this should tell you is technology transfer is not licensing agreements. Technology transfer is people walking across the street. It moves on two feet. If it didn't move on two feet, there would not be a need for that cluster. And that cluster is typified again by another picture here, which is the biotech Kendall Square, where again you see to the left here, uh, MIT and the Broad Institute and the Koch Institute, but then to the right of that, the cluster of biotechnology and uh, pharmaceutical companies here in New England that is taking the innovations that's being talked about today and in this meeting and in the past uh, and translating that into societal impact. So we're in the midst of the uh, genomic revolution. It is ongoing and, and very powerful. Uh, and we've called that in a publication produced at MIT, uh, a, a white paper, the third revolution no, sorry, the second revolution. We picture the first revolution as Watson and Crick and the discovery of the structure of DNA. The second revolution we've commented on as the genomics revolution. Uh, it's integral to all the biotech and all the innovation that occurred in that 70s, 80s, and 90s. 
And what we're anticipating is that the third revolution, the changes that will happen over the coming decades and have a very significant impact on society, is the integration of life science into the physics, computation, and engineering sciences, and an expansion of the life science activities into other areas of society, taking the information that has been so brilliantly discussed in the, the keynote lecture into society. Now, this, there's an analogy here that, uh, that Susan Hockfield has commented on that I think captures some of the spirit of what this third revolution is about. Uh, the quote is, physicists gave engineers the electron and they created the IT revolution. And biologists gave engineers the gene and together they will create the future. And the idea that the gene will play a role as broad and as complex in society as the electron, I think captures what I anticipate and will hope to make more of a case for in the coming moments uh, of what lies before us in biological science. Now, Eric has already talked about the tremendous advances in sequencing, and I stole this slide from him many years ago. It just shows the increasing production of sequences over the last decade of advancement in, in uh, genomics. And what that tells us, and as he mentioned, the impact of the Human Genome Project was enormous in terms of teaching us about the genome. But perhaps the most significant impact is the ability to sequence the information in all life forms, which will allow us to link our knowledge of biological systems all the way from ecology and, and plants to human and medicine. And that integration is what really has led us to a new moment in time. And that information, as he's talked to you already in, biomed uh, in the biomedical sciences, is going to lead us to uh, more personalized or, in, or uh, uh, individualized medicine, uh, an accessibility to information that is really changing the way we understand biological systems and biomedical systems, and as well to understand the nature of diseases in single individuals. And in time, I think this has the biggest possibility of increasing the quality of health care as well as controlling the cost of that increased quality in health care affordability. And I'll just use an example which runs directly from the, or comes directly from the comments that Eric has just made uh, of a uh, diagram that Danny Asiello, the head of medicine until a few, until a year ago at MGH produced in the uh, uh, his vision of what the future of medicine is going to be like. And what is shown at the top of this slide is all the elements that he pictures will be required to do both predictive models on the left to create new drugs and new treatments for diseases, and on the right, actionable insights for the patient in terms of either treatment of disease or control of that uh, disease. And what you see at the top is genomic sciences, cellular analysis, personal information in terms of diet and habits, physiology of, of the individual in terms of longitudinal records and metabolics, as well as clinical input in terms of just the diagnosis of the patient. And what you see to the right here is the patient. This places the patient at the middle of discovery and that's what we can do now with the technologies we have. We can move information and explore diseases directly at the level of the patient. And it makes this virtual circle a possibility and a much more effective way of treating and developing new drugs. But as well, as we look at this, this information is going to be available to the patient. And that's shown here where the patient is moved to the level or in, in conjunction with the physicians and the knowledge integration and the medical history. And this actually empowerment of the patient with new information and the ability to seek information given 
the input that comes from all those analysis is actually going to make a more informed consumer. And that more informed consumer is going to drive the way we understand and deliver medicine in the future. So this revolution is not only going to impact in terms of our knowledge base, it's also going to change the way we practice and understand medicine over decades.